Hey guys, it's Andrew with HKN, and uh, we have a second part of our common filter video here, which is an example with some code. So um, this example is what's called a white noise acceleration model, or a nearly constant velocity model of straight line motion. So what you see here is we have x of k, which is going to literally denote the x position of a car or whatever, just something that's going to be moving. Um, and also the velocity. So it's a two-dimensional vector of position and velocity. Uh, so th basically, this is the uh, state matrix that shows a linear, um, a linear velocity, a straight line motion velocity. Um, and over here, what we say is that the noise here is going to simulate some kind of acceleration. So basically, we're going to have a noisy acceleration. It's going to be not constant. It's going to be changing every time step. Um, and obviously, the, uh, by the um, equations of motion from linear kinematics, we know that uh, it affects the position by 1 half t squared and affects the velocity for a constant acceleration over a certain time period uh, with t. This is assuming that between time k and time k plus 1, you get a constant acceleration that is the value uh, vk. Uh, and then the measurement that we're getting, you see here our measurement vector here, 1, 0, multiplying our x of k, uh, which is going to be uh, position velocity, uh, is that we're just getting position measurements. So we're going to try to estimate the position where we're measuring position. And obviously we get some noise. Um, the variance of the v of k, which is of dimension 1 by 1, so it's just a scalar, v of k is a scalar in this case, um, the, uh, the dimension of the, the, sorry, the variance of it is 0 point, uh, 0 0.01. Um, and the variance of this noise is 1. And the t for the length of time that we're assuming between k and k plus 1 um, is 1 second. So uh, now in order to initialize this, um, in order to initialize this, we need an initial guess. So, um, the, so we know that x0 is going to be uh, equal to 0, uh, 10. So we need a guess for initializing this. We need an x0, 0, or what I call here x11, because we're going to be um, doing a two-point initialization. So in order to get a velocity guess, what we're going to do is we're just going to take the position at one time, the position at the previous time, subtract and divide by the time difference. Because that's the best kind of information we have. So x11 here is given as, so x11 here uh, is going to be, we're going to guess the position at time 1 is our measurement for the position at time 1, because we have no other information at this point. Um, and we're going to guess that the velocity is the difference between our two positions at 1 and 0 divided by t. Like I just said, that's called a two-point initialization. And now what we're going to do is we're going to find what, uh, what the covariance of this estimate is, which is exactly the estimate, or uh, the expected value of our estimate at time 1, 1, minus the exact value at time 1. And then because it's variance, we need the squared value of this. Um, technically, uh, it should actually be, uh, so that's actually incorrect, it would be the technical definition for variance is that you only square it when it's a scalar, otherwise you multiply by the transpose of the vector. So we get 1 given 1 minus x of 1, uh, which is a vector, transpose, and we're done. So what we're going to do very quickly is we're going to just prove that this P11 is correct, and then we're going to move on to some code where I'm going to show you the Kalman filter working. So we have x11, and that guess for the, uh, we're going to do this step by step, so we're going to give, this is obviously going to be uh, symmetric across the diagonal, so let's just go with the first, um, let's just go with the top left hand term. So the top left-hand term is that our estimate is uh, z of 1, and then we're going to minus x of 1, and then we're going to evaluate this value squared, and we want the expected value of it. So z of 1, 
at any time, we know that from our measurement equation here, z of 1 is going to equal to x of 1 plus some noise at time 1. Um, this may not be exactly accurate, but it's close enough that we get a good variance on the estimate. So if we replace this here, we get x, x1 plus w1 minus x1. So that's x1 minus x1. We just get w1. So this is the expectation of w at time 1 squared. Well, w is our uh, variance, which is, independent, is, is our noise, which is independent across time. And the expectation of that squared, given that it's a zero mean process, uh, is actually just our um, is actually just our measurement covariance r, which is one in this case. So if we do this for the second one, we would get x hat one one minus. Uh, sorry, it would be uh, x at. Uh, so for the 2-2 two -two equation, which is our, uh, our variance of our velocity estimate. So that would be the estimate of this, the expected value of this squared. So we get z1 minus z0 over t. When, because we know this is a linear motion, it's going to take the form of x1 minus x0 over t, and that's going to be our actual velocity. And we want the estimate of the expected value of this squared as our 2, 2 covariance. So this is our p of 1 given 1, element 1, 1. Uh, element 1, 1. Yeah. Um, so if we know that z1 and z0 are defined in this way, x0 plus w0, and because of the whiteness property, we know that the expectation of w1, w0 is equal to 0. If we plug in these here, take the subtraction, we find that this is the expected value of not x but w1 minus w0 over t squared. And using this property, if we FOIL this out and expand it, we find that we end up with w1 squared. Um, plus w2, w0 squared, I guess I'll just write that, the expectation of w1 squared plus w0 squared, plus a cross term, but we know that the cross covariances are going to be 0, all divided by t squared. And if we look at this, well, this is a variance, this is a variance, and they're the same variance, they're actually just r. So we get 2r over t squared. So we proved the top two, and I'll leave the, the side two here, r over t, as an exercise for you to do. You will get r over t, where r in this case is 1. I didn't plug that in here. I plugged it in for the top left, but not these guys, uh, just to, because I was going to prove these. So uh, now we're going to move on to the MATLAB. So we're going to show you guys this uh, example in motion. So this is, uh, this is some MATLAB code that I wrote. Um, you see at the top here that uh, I've initialized t as one second as it was given in the problem. Um, we're going to run this for 50 sample times, so k is going to go from 0 to uh, 50. And then we have, um, so we initialize our variables here in line 5 and 6 as x and z. So x is a, of length um, is of length 2 by 1, uh, and then there are 51 samples. Same thing with z. x here, uh, we give an initial estimate, so we've just given our initial estimate as uh, 0, 1. Uh, sorry, that's our, that's our initialization value. We know that we're going to start 
our uh, process being at 0, 0.0 and with a velocity of 10. So then we define f and g, uh, sorry, f and gamma, which we're going to call g, um, in this situation here. Uh, and our measurement matrix H, our covariances, these are just all the givens for the problem from lines 1 to 16. Uh, and they're given over time. So now what the next thing down here is from lines 18 to 23 is that we are generating our true values here. So we need truth to compare to. So all we do is propagate this based on some random process. You know that uh, from the above that uh, rand n gives you a Gaussian random sequence. And if you multiply that by the square root of the variance, you get a, um, a Gaussian process that's zero mean with the given variance. So now uh, what the lines 18 to 23 is, they literally just propagate those equations to get us the truth. Um, so now we're going to get into the real crux of what the Kalman filter is doing. And it's surprisingly few lines of code. So the first thing we have to do is initialize the state estimate and covariance of the time sequences. So the initial, uh, initialize means give the initial guess. So x hat kk um, is going to be our, uh, our guess at time k. Uh, pkk is going to be the variance of that guess or that estimate as, we, as it's more formally called. Um, so we need to give our initial value and this is our x hat uh, 1 1 but it has to be 2, 2 because of the indexing in MATLAB. Um, and we give it as our, uh, as we said in the problem formulation, that we're going to uh, take the position at the second time instance and the differencing of the position divided by our sampling time for the velocity as our initial guess. PKK here, uh, which was proved to you previously, uh, and except for the, uh, the cross terms, which I left for you, just input it here. Um, so then what we do is we have uh, the for loop and the for loop comes back for loop comes back to the fact that this is an iterative process so we're going to so we have time step um, we have time step one so we just need to um, update everything previously so starting at time step two uh, we have x hat of k plus one given k which I've written as x hat k one k because uh, you can't write plus in a variable so we have our propagation equation. There is no input here. So all we do is we multiply f by our previous estimate to get the predicted estimate. Uh, and that is done in line tw uh, 35. Line 36 shows the covariance of this predicted, esti of this predicted estimate, uh, which was given by the equations in the previous video as f times the covariance of the, uh, times the, covariance of the previous estimate times f uh, transpose. Transpose in MATLAB is, a, uh, is an apostrophe, plus uh, gamma times the covariance of the noise times uh, gamma prime. The next thing we do is we predict our measurement, and that's done in line 37. So we have z hat of k plus 1, so we're predicting for the measurement for the next time step, time step given our estimate, uh, given our predicted measurement, our uh, predicted state for the next time step by just multiplying by the measurement matrix, or the measurement vector in this case. Uh, and that's done again in line 37. So that was the prediction phase. We now need to do the innovation and gain. So S, which is the covariance of your, um, which is the covariance of your estimate of z hat k1, um, also called the innovation, is S of k plus 1. And that's given by this formula here, H times the uh, covariance of, of the estimate of x, of the predicted estimate of x, times h transpose, plus the covariance of your measurement error, of your measurement noise. Um, we then calculate the gain for our estimate, which is w of k plus 1, written as wk1 here in line 40, um, which has a formula which can be proven to you by pretty much anyone, but this is the form. It takes uh, pk plus 1 given k, um, times h transpose, and then you take the inverse uh, and mu multiply it by the inverse of your innovation, which in MATLAB can be done by just doing a backslash, um, making sure that everything is uh, positive, definite, and everything it has to be uh, well conditioned. So now, once we have these, all of these things, we will go into the update phase, which at this point we assume that we take the measurement at the next time step, at time k plus one. 
So we calculate the difference in our estimate of the measurement and the actual measurement and call that new, and that's done in line 42. Uh, we then take the, uh, the measurement, sorry, the gain, which is WK plus one, multiply it by this error and add it on to our previous estimate to get the estimate at the current time given the measurement at the current time done in line 43 and called x hat of kk. Um, so we're back to the starting. We started with an x hat of kk and we have a, the next time steps x hat of kk. So we've actually made our prediction given the, all of the uh, measurements up to the current time. Um, so we have our next estimate. And all you would do is repeat this process. We obviously have in 44 the covariance of this estimate as well, which is interesting to show for accuracy of these measurements. Um, and there's also used for other things, but it's calculated um, in a very similar way as seen in line 44. Um, but basically, once we go through that process, you repeat it for each time step until we're done. Uh, in line 47, I've, all I've done there is create a uh, time axis for us, and everything below is just some plots of, um, of our estimate versus our truth for position and velocity. So now what we're going to do is we're going to run this program. So we've got to go over into editor in the top here uh, and click run. Uh, change folder. And this should take a couple of seconds to run. And once it's done, we should get some plots. OK, so let's look at figure one first. We have figure two there. Um, but let's maximize figure one here. So what we see is that we expected a linear motion, which is in blue there. And our estimate, which is in eight, which is in orange, uh, fair, uh, goes to it very closely. If we, uh, if we were to zoom in on this, you would see that it, only uh, it would only differ from it by maybe a few meters or what have you. So yeah, let's zoom in very quickly. We see, we zoom in on this little area here. It only goes off by a little bit, which uh, is very good because we had uh, a complete uncertainty in what our, uh, in what our position actually was because this thing was actually accelerating a little bit. And also we had an uncertainty in our measurement so we didn't even know exactly where it was. So that's good. Our, our uh, position measurements are good. So let's look at the second figure here, which is our estimate of velocity. So let's maximize that again. And what we see is that this is a little bit more noisy, uh, which is to be expected because we don't have a measurement of this directly. We're kind of like have a one layer of abstraction here. We've interpolated our velocity from our measurements of position. So this is a little worse, but you see it's not too far off. You look at the time, if you look at the scale on the left hand side here, we're off by less than about half a meter per second in every time step. So that's not so bad uh, given what we have. But what I wanted to show you with this example was how powerful estimation can be given an uncertain, given an uncertain process of motion and even uncertain measurements, we can get very, very close estimates as to what is exactly going on. Um, and I hope you guys learned something. I hope that uh, this, I, I'll try to post this code online. Uh, we'll link to it. And I uh, hope you guys learned something. Have a nice day. Bye.